Bonsoir. My name is Anne Broom, Chair of the Friends of the Library, and once again, I'm really delighted to see so many people here this evening uh, to another in our series of lectures for the Friends of the Library in this newly renovated Colgate Room. We're here for a treat this evening with Ben Selling, author and noted social historian Judith Flanders, who is going to cast a sharp eye on the myths, legends, and history of Christmas. I'm going to draw a picture for us of the season as it's never been seen before. <laughs> Professor Natalie Cook will introduce Judith more fully in a few moments. As you may know, the Friends of the Library are advocates and supporters, and we're deeply committed to promoting and enhancing McGill's great <laughs> library. Each year, we share our passion for the library, for learning, and for the advancement of knowledge by hosting and supporting three great public lectures the F.R. Scott, the Hugh McLennan, and the Shakespeare, which actually just took place last week with Scott Wentworth from the Stratford Festival, as well as with a series of more intimate lectures such as this one this evening. We are happy to provide, uh, the, these lectures here, the smaller ones, provide an opportunity for more intimate interaction with our speakers, so we're delighted to have those. We are also extremely proud to be supporters of the library's new Fiat Look project, which is Fiat Lux project, which is going to uh, renovate the library and re-envision it for our 21st century users. If you're not already a friend of the library, which I hope many of you or most of you are, I would encourage you to join. We've got pamphlets out uh, at the entrance and later at the reception. Hopefully you'll pick up one and become a, a friend of the library. It enables you to get first-hand crack at all of our events and also to support the library and the great treasure that uh, McGill's Library is. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you uh, to attend our Friends Annual General Meeting, which will take place on September, sorry, December the 6th in this very room. Uh, at that meeting, we also take the opportunity to present our Friend of the Year Award, and I'm very proud and happy to say that this year's friend will be Cecil Rabinovich, who's here with us. Where are you, Cecil? He is the past president and chair of the Friends and a vital, vital member, ongoing member of our committee. So I do hope you would join us at that AGM. Without further ado, I would like to ask Professor Natalie Cook to come forward to introduce our speaker. Natalie is the Associate Dean of ROAR, as I like to say, I think she has the best title in the university. And uh, the ROAR stands for Rare Books, the Osler History of Medicine Library, Art and Archives. Natalie, would you come forward? Thanks so much, Anne. I'm absolutely <coughs> delighted be able to introduce our speaker tonight, the acclaimed social historian and best-selling author Judith Flanders. I'm particularly pleased to welcome her back here to Rare Books and Special Collections, where she has spent a lot of time this year in the quiet of the reading room, although perhaps you've heard it wasn't so quiet this summer as we were refurbishing this particular space. So it's actually a homecoming of sorts for Judith. She was born in England and moved to Montreal when she was two years old, and she grew up here. She was educated at the Chateau Briamont in Lausanne, Switzerland, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and at Skidmore College in New York State. She worked in the field of publishing for 15 years before turning to writing. And the Victorian era has really been Judith's main subject since her first book, a Circle of Sisters in 2001, which received great acclaim and was nominated for the Guardian First Book Award. Her subsequent books include the best-selling The Victorian House, Domestic Life from Childbirth to Deathbed in 2003, which was shortlisted for the British Book Awards History Book of the Year, The New York Times best-selling The Invention of Murder in 2011, shortlisted for the CWA Gold Dagger for Nonfiction, The Victorian City, Everyday Life in Dickens, London, we're moving closer to Christmas, 2012, <laughs> shortlisted for the Los Angeles Times History Book of the Year, and The Making of Home in 2014. 
Judith also writes the acclaimed Sam Clare series of crime novels and contributes articles, features, and reviews for a range of publications, including The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times Literary Supplement, and The Sunday Telegraph, among others. And if you think she doesn't have time, on top of this, her most recent book and the inspiration for tonight's talk is Christmas, a biography, which is on sale actually in the reading room for afterwards, which takes a close look at the history, nostalgia, myths, and traditions inexorably linked to the holiday. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to the Christmas season, its music and decorations, which officially came to Rare Books this afternoon, by the way, and you'll be experiencing it a bit later, <coughs> later on, but also in extending an even warmer welcome to Judith, here to explain why Christmas ain't what it used to be. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and thank you, Anne, Natalie, for inviting me, um, and Chris, um, head of Rare Books and Archives, for tolerating me this summer. Um, I arrived in exam season and immediately said, there are students in this library. <laughs> and Chris took pity on me, and I went and hid in Rare Books for the rest of the summer. So I'm very grateful to all of you. It was, I will say, a little noisier than you would expect. It was the day they said, they're taking the floor up today. <laughs> but seeing the renovation of this room um, due to the generosity of the Hatch sisters, it's worth it. So um, I'm very grateful to be here. And um, I came to writing about this book through a semi-unusual route. Um, normally you say it's been a lifelong interest and a total passion. Actually my publisher said, maybe a book on Christmas would be a good idea. And I said, fabulous. And then after 20 minutes I said, oh you mean me? <laughs> that hadn't actually occurred to me. I thought he was talking about somebody else entirely. Um, but it did sound like a good idea. It also sounded like a really straightforward idea. Um, you have the nativity, you move on to the church, you move on to family, to commerce. I thought, okay, it's straightforward. It's a story of high beginnings, a cozy, nice, warm middle, and then we'll have the hard lucre, the chill commerce at the end. And that is how the story is often told. But I wasn't sure it was the real story. For a start, of course, every Christmas is different. The Christmas of Catholic Spain is not the Christmas of South American Spain. The Christmas of Protestant Germany is different from the Christmas of Protestant Denmark, not to even consider the differences between Protestant England and Protestant New England. But religion, I discovered, was a very small element, a surprisingly small element of Christmas as we know it. Because what I found, there's Christmas, the way we celebrate it in our own culture. And then there's Christmas, the way we celebrate it in our own homes. And then there's Christmas, the way it's marked in the mass media, in film, in television, newspapers, and magazines. All of those Christmases are related to each other, but they're not identical. Because then, of course, there's Christmas. There's that wondrous, nostalgically perfect day that we all think we remember, but the day that no actual Christmas recaptures. The poet C. Day Lewis said, there are not Christmases, there is only Christmas, a composite day made up from the haunting impression of many Christmas days, a work of art painted by memory because each of us is a storehouse of Christmases. And because of that, Christmas is magical. It enables us, like the White Queen in Alice in Wonderland, who could believe six impossible things before breakfast, we can believe 
dozens of impossible things, often dozens of mutually contradictory impossible things about Christmas without even trying, actually often without even knowing we do it. Because the holiday piles legend upon legend, what I finally got to as my sort of tag whenever anyone asked me about is this true, is that true, is whatever you know about Christmas is wrong. <laughs> we know Santa Claus was created in the Netherlands, or maybe his red suit was invented by Coca-Cola. Prince Albert brought German Christmas trees to Britain, or was it the Hessian soldiers who took them to revolutionary America? Roman Saturnalia was the origin of Christmas Day, unless, of course, it was the Feast of Woden. Except, of course, none of those things is true. At Christmas and about Christmas, what is true, what we think is true, is almost impossible to separate from things we would like to believe are true. The two central assumptions that are commonly made, I think, about Christmas is that it's religious in origin and that the tradition of each speaker's country embody the real Christmas, the ones that all of the others are just sort of these pseudo imitations. That Christmas was once religious and only in our pathetic, debased commercial age has it been reduced to the current market, marketable, commodified form, is such a common idea that it actually comes as a surprise when you look at the history of the day. Obviously, first and foremost, Christmas was the day established by the church to mark the nativity of Christ. But that obviousness makes us assume that the old Christmas, the real Christmas, was a deeply solemn religious event that our own capitalist secular society has spoiled in some ways. And then the second assumption that our Christmas is real is equally reflexive and automatic. Most people in North America, in England, in Germany, think Christmas is really a North American, English, German invention. Germans think that the Teutonic solstice myths, the trees, the advent wreaths, the seasonal markets, the roast goose and red cabbage, which actually sounds good, um, is the authentic holiday custom. And anyone else's version is, is just a fraud. The English think that their mince pies and plum puddings, their ghost stories or their Dickens readings are the essence of the day. In the USA, it's the birthplace of Santa Claus and of Christmas stockings, of giant outdoor trees. And to them, Christmas is just as obviously um, American, and the rest of the world is only imitating them. But even when we consider our Christmas to be the true ones, we, meaning most people in the West today who mark Christmas in some ways, we don't stick to our customs either. We draw on an amalgam. We take the elements we like. We drop the ones that we don't like. And we shake them up. We mix them together with a couple of centuries of what newspapers and magazines, film and television tell us we should be doing. And we end up not with one culture's Christmas, but with something entirely new a holiday that is recognized across the world, but that belongs to nowhere in particular. And so once I realized that, I decided that what I wanted to look at was not the detail, the flow, but how we look at these myths, how we build up these stories for ourselves, that Christmas is really a big story we tell ourselves. And so what I thought I would do tonight, rather than telling you one long story about something, is that I would give you a few short looks at certain elements and different aspects of the day. And food was, from the earliest period, the most important part of the holiday. Um, the first recorded Christmas comes in the fourth century. And um, 
that was when it was decided by the Bishop of Rome that the 25th of December, which for a long, boring, complicated reason I won't go into here, um, was the solstice, not the hour 21st, um, would mark Christmas Day. Only 30 years later, an archbishop had to warn his congregation um, about spending the day feasting to excess and dancing too much. Um, already, these were the things that people were doing on Christmas Day. Nobody warns anybody about stuff that isn't going on. So we know that feasting was, um, well, it's, it's true. Um, you know, don't put beans up your nose, kids. Nobody says that. Um, and so what we see is from the beginning, feasting and parties were part of the day. In Britain, by the 16th century, there were, for the rich, already dishes that were considered specifically Christmassy. One poet itemized good bread and good drink, brawn pudding, beef, mutton, and pork, shred pies of the best, pig, veal, goose, and capon, and turkey well-dressed. So as we can see, even now, meat is the centerpiece of the holiday. Braun headed the list for centuries. Um, originally, Braun meant wild boar, but gradually it came to mean um, shredded pork, which was pressed into a mold like pate, and possibly because it was no longer animal-shaped. In the Middle Ages, there was some probably deliberate confusion. Um, the month of Advent, the, the, the three and a half weeks of Advent, are, were in the church a fast period. You weren't allowed to eat meat. Somehow, magically, brawn became a fish dish. <laughs> um, so it's amazing how you can confuse those things, isn't it? More flamboyantly ceremonial was a whole boar's head, which had been part of the Christmas feasts of the great from at least the 13th century. The boar's head carol um, was probably written in the 15th century. And by the 16th century, um, the, the, the boar's head was sort of a symbol of Christmas feasting, whether you actually had one or not. Um, I discovered that many of the descriptions of the origins of it as a Christmas dish sounded remarkably similar, as though they were all coming from one source, um, which was that at some unstated but misty time in the past, a student at Oxford was walking in the woods when he was attacked by a wild boar. Um, managing to save himself by thrusting his copy of Aristotle into <laughs> the boar's mouth. But he was, he was thrifty. In order to rescue his book, he cut off the boar's head, um, <laughs> took out his book, and also had the head served up to his fellow students. Um, they don't make students like they used to, do they? <laughs> the Shred pies that the poet mentioned were, by the 16th century, also known as mince pies. And they were made of various types of minced or shredded meat, uh, beef, mutton, veal, and until the 18th century when sugar became more widely available and much cheaper and they became sweet rather than savory. When that poem was written in the 16th century, turkeys were a relative novelty. Um, sorry, I'm... And um, they had just been brought to uh, the New World by the Spanish. But by the 19th century, they were common enough that stagecoaches um, laden with the turkeys, that's a detail on the right, um, became a regular sight on the roads. Um, taking the birds to the major cities for the holidays. In that poem, there was no mention, surprisingly, of another Christmas dish, um, but even then, what was then known as plum broth or plum porridge was well known. And like the shred pies, it too, at that point, was savory rather than sweet. It was actually beef soup thickened with breadcrumbs and dried fruit. 
And an 18th century Swiss traveler um, said very firmly, if you weren't English, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> um, but by the 1840s, it had turned into plum pudding and had become a, a symbol of the holiday. It didn't even need to say Christmas anymore. Drink, too, was ever-present on the holiday. To celebrate Christmas, said one newspaper, was to celebrate rioting and drunkenness. And this is probably not far from the truth. At the beginning of the 19th century, a London court heard testimony from a murder suspect who reported that unfortunately he could not tell the court where he had been the, the night, sorry, where he had been the night his wife was killed because he said, I have not the smallest recollection of what passed on Christmas Day. I was so much in liquor. Um, on the whole, things didn't change. If you read the court reports, you will see just endless reports of drunken disorderly charges um, going through the century. And by the start of the 20th century, um, a US drinks manufacturer of soft drinks, they, it was a sort of soda water, uh, ran a decade-long seasonal campaign showing Santa with a drink, including this one, which was run all through Prohibition. Um, Santa, well, it's, it's a hard season. Santa needs stuff to get through. Um, another element that symbolized the holiday for centuries was winter greenery. In the early seventh century, uh, Pope Gregory the Great had noted that decorating churches and holy places with green branches was a custom of the British Isles, although it wasn't yet seasonal. It happened as much in midsummer as in winter. And a 16th century historian said that in every parish there was a great pole outside serving as a maypole in the summer and then decorated with holly and ivy in the winter for what he said was the disport of Christmas to the people. This wasn't yet a Christmas tree as we know it, but it was definitely a precursor because an association of Christmas trees and, Christ uh, trees and Christmas was emerging particularly strongly in the German-speaking countries. Originally, there had been a genre in the Middle Ages called the Paradise Play, which was done on the Feast of Adam and Eve, which was the 24th of December, when um, the, there was a, an outdoor depiction of the story of Genesis. And the tree of knowledge, obviously, could not be an apple tree. So they used, in midwinter, an evergreen, and they tied apples on the branches. The plays went out of fashion, but the trees hung around. And we know that as early as 1419, in Freiburg, there was a giant tree outside, decorated with apples and tinsel and gingerbread. And there was another one a couple of decades later in Reval, in what is now Estonia. Um, although it, from the description, we're not 100% sure, it might have been one of those decorated poles. The first indoor tree we know of was in 1605 in Strasbourg, and that was the region of Germany that became the center of the Christmas tree tradition. This tradition traveled to England and North America slowly through the 18th century. In 1789, we have um, a diary, a husband of a lady-in-waiting to Queen Charlotte, who was German herself, suggested putting up what he said was an illuminated tree according to the German fashion. His wife didn't like the idea. She said it was too expensive, and anyway, the children weren't there. It wasn't worth it. So it sounds like they were both familiar with this custom although the first tree we absolutely know of in England was in 1800 at Windsor, when Queen Charlotte herself had one. Two years earlier, uh, the poet Coleridge had gone to North Germany and visited a family and watched their ceremony as they lit the candles on a tree on Christmas Eve and exchanged presents. 
both of which were customs he did not recognize. He wrote about it in um, a newspaper column, which then became terribly popular and was reprinted every Christmas in both the US and um, in Britain, which popularized the ceremony um, for, for, for more widely. Um, this is an image, um, it's dated, you can see in the middle, 1809. Um, we actually know the artist was about seven years old in 1809. So the assumption is this is a memory of his from that date. But you can see on the right-hand side what is very firmly labeled Christmas tree. Um, so there, there is that. In 1848, however, the custom went mainstream. The Illustrated London News Magazine published this engraving of Victoria and Albert beside a tabletop tree at Windsor. And this single image cemented the idea of the tree in the popular consciousness. And so much so that by the time Albert died in 1861, the notion that he was the um, importer of the tradition was firm in everyone's minds. In the USA, however, they took this, this illustration and they made it more democratic. Um, one of the most popular magazines in the US, uh, they took off Queen Victoria's jewelry, they removed Albert's stat sash, and also rather peculiarly his mustache, um, and they reduced the number of presents under the tree, it was retitled just the Christmas tree as though it was an ordinary domestic scene and it was therefore presented as something every home should aim for. That is in incredibly brief overview the story of the tree. But it brought to my mind other elements that we overlook. For example, I wondered about the presents under the tree, or to be more specific, their wrapping. The engraving of Victoria and Albert showed all the toys unwrapped, as though that were usual. And indeed, I discovered just when presents began to be wrapped is rather difficult to pin down. Early mentions are rare, and it's not always possible to tell whether they're talking about what we would call gift wrapping, or just what the shops put things in to protect them as the presents went home. But as late as 1880s, I found a children's book which described a German Christmas, and it felt it needed to explain. Every present is wrapped up in paper, it wrote, and labeled from Mary to Jane, or Jane to Mary, as the case may be. Um, the wrapped present, therefore, arrived sometime in the middle of the 19th century. And that fits in very neatly with what I like to call the um, Victorian decor um, overview. Things to put things in or things to cover things with. Obviously, partly this was a matter of taste, but it was also to do with technology. New, ga uh, new gas lighting was easier, it was cheaper, it was safer than candles. But gas gives off a residue and it degrades dyes, it damages metals, it also sticks on everything. So when you also have a coal fire, the soot from the fire would then stick all over, the res all over this residue. And thus the great Victorian passion for all of that fabric can be understood as simply a way of trying to keep everything clean. So as coverings became routine, it may be that covering presents, which had not previously been thought of, began to appear normal. And this was happening too, just as the new mass market was gearing up. Um, and it may be that giving somebody a ready-made present from a shop seemed cold when compared to a present that had been made at home. And therefore, wrapping it up yourself at home showed that you cared enough. And indeed, today, 
one of the things, of course, um, that I, I became aware of when I started to think about this. If people give you homemade jam, they never wrap it up. The labor involved in making jam somehow makes it fine as a present. You don't have to wrap it. Whereas something you buy from a shop, you always wrap. So that seemed to blend into with advancing technology where um, new technology meant made printed papers um, and colored paper more easily and cheaply available. Um, thus, these patterned, printed, decorated items could be used once and disposed of um, rather than an expensive luxury in their own right. They also, therefore, of course, became big business. In the USA, the Denison Manufacturing Company of Maine, which had previously made um, boxes for jewelers, in the 1870s began to import colored tissue paper for retailers, which soon it also began to sell directly to customers through Sears Roebuck, later adding a um, instruction booklet explaining to these new people how to wrap presents. In World War I, a postcard salesman in Kansas City found um, what they called gift dressings were no longer available because of the war. And so he had a stock of um, luxury envelopes, which he had bought in France before the war, and he opened them up and took out the printed linings and sold these printed linings individually by the sheet. And these were so popular that the next year he bundled them up, he packed them and sold them, ultimately beginning to manufacture his own um, together with booklets that told his customers, your packages reflect your personality. And his name, by the way, was Mr. Hall, and thus was born the Hallmark Company. Um, soon, um, in the 1920s, technology made the presents prettier because you could get now colored and curled ribbon. And in 1932, it became easier with the arrival of scotch tape. Um, then, once you have this nice present, there's the selling of presents. Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade likes to present itself as the first and, of course, the most important Christmas parade. But we nice, modest people north of the border know that, in reality, it was we who invented the Christmas parade. And we didn't feel the need to hide it as Thanksgiving, either. Because the first, thank the, the first holiday parade was held in Toronto by Eaton's department store. Like many other shops, Eaton's had been using Santa in its advertising from the 1890s. And like many other shops, by the turn of the century, it also had a Santa in the store for children to visit. It was almost as an afterthought. In 1905, um, an advertisement for the store announced the train that Santa was going to arrive on in the city and invited customers to meet him at the station. And such was the response that the following year, Eaton's made his trip longer and more dramatic. They put him in a carriage pulled by white horses and with trumpeters to announce to all who passed by who the august visitor within was. That's him once he's arrived at the store. Uh, that was in 1925. Um, but before that, by 1911, um, the short trip from the station had come to take two entire days, and it wound around the city. Well, I don't think you were supposed to follow it for the whole two days. Um, and there were banners promoting Toyland at Eaton's, and Eaton's owner, I believe, is actually on the roof there somewhere, too. And as the years rolled on, each parade offered something new to top the previous visit. That is 1913, um, when real reindeer were brought in from Lapland. Another year, there was a 20-piece band. Sometimes there were floats with characters from nursery rhymes. One year, Santa sat on top of a giant fish. 
And if there was a reason for that, it is lost to history. Um, on another, more logically, he sat on an iceberg surrounded by, I believe, not real polar bears, but I've got to tell you, it's not actually very clear. Um, he got to the store, so I'm assuming they weren't real. In 1919, very excitingly, Santa shunned the train for a more thrilling arrival by plane, which was filmed and screened in movie theaters. But always, of course, the aim was the same. After the parade, come to Toyland. The parade's fame spread. Women's Wear Daily in New York covered it. Um, department store representatives from New York, from Chicago, Detroit, and even one from Australia arrived. In 1925, with the opening of the Montreal Eatons, the f floats became much more elaborate because the parades could be scheduled a few days apart and they would be used here and then they would go on the train and they would be used again in Toronto. In 1935, uh, the store established a Santa Claus parade in Winnipeg, and it was there that one of the most important elements took off, because up until then, the parades were an add-on. They were a way of drawing attention to the store, to the windows, so people would look at the stock. Now they became community events. In the first year in Winnipeg, they held a series of talent contests on the radio with 350 children auditioning in the run-up to have spots in the parade. And two years later, um, the Montreal Parade was watched by nearly a quarter of a million people, which is one in four of the island's population. I showed you the picture um, that in 1913 the Eaton's brought reindeer to the parade as a standard symbol of Christmas. But in truth, the main thing to say about reindeer is no one has the faintest idea how they got into this story. Um, well, we know how. Um, we don't know why. In 1809, the, uh, Washington Irving wrote a story about St. Nicholas, whom he described as riding jollily among the treetops or over the roofs of houses, now and then drawing forth magnificent presents from his breeches pockets and dropping them down the chimneys of his favorites. And that 1809 date is the first mention of the saint's ability to fly through the air. It was not before 1821, however, that a children's book, The Children's Friend, changed the gift bringer and now, for the first time, made him Santa Claus, not St. Nicholas, who went prancing about on the rooftops. And according to this story, he appeared on Christmas Eve, not on the 6th of December, which is St. Nicholas's Saint's Day, and said the text, Old Santa Claus, with much delight, his reindeer drives this frosty night, o'er chimney tops and tracks of snow, to bring his yearly gifts to yo. No, it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> um, my, my motto is I read the lousy book so you don't have to. Um, the book was anonymous, but most historians think it was probably written by a friend of Washington Irving's named James Paulding. And that would make sense because the following year, another friend of Washington Irving's, Clement Clark Moore, wrote a poem that would be far more successful, a visit from St. Nicholas, or as we generally know it now, the night before Christmas. That's um, a non-flying Santa from the illu first illustrated edition. But it was in this story that the reindeer got names. We all know, now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Dunder and Blixen. But as you will note, there was no Rudolph in Moore's list. Rudolph, in fact, didn't show up for another century. He was a commercial innovation, which at this stage is no surprise. In 1939, a copywriter working for the retail chain Montgomery Ward, a man named Robert May, produced a pamphlet for customers' children. In May's story, um, the reindeer ostracized their regrettably red-nosed fellow deer, 
Ha ha, look at Rudolph, his nose is a sight. It's red as a beet, twice as big, twice as bright. Until one Christmas Eve, Santa's rounds are disrupted by a terrible fog. He stumbles into Rudolph's bedroom, sees the nose shining in the fog, and asks for help. So in ugly duckling fashion, the story ends with the bullying reindeer watching sadly as their once despised friend gets, is riding with Santa and guiding his sleigh, the number one job on the number one day. <laughs> the retailer gave away nearly two and a half million copies of this masterpiece. Um, but perhaps not surprisingly, the story had no further impact until a decade later when um, May's brother-in-law, a man named Johnny Marks, was a songwriter. He set it to music. It was recorded by Gene Autry, the singing cowboy. It reached number one in the charts, and it sold millions. And that, of course, leads me on to the next subject, which is Christmas music. The earliest Christmas music, dating from the fourth century, had been written by churchmen and for churchmen and concerned the theological implications for the, of the nativity. These compositions were not known by or for the general population. And in fact, as late as the 12th century, a carol was a secular French song accompanied by a dance to be sung in springtime. And actually, if you think about it, our usage in English today, where we say a Christmas carol, as though there are other kinds of carols and we need to distinguish, is a throwback to the fact that originally carols were not Christmas at all. What we mean by a Christmas carol um, was very difficult when I started to work on this. Um, as far as I could see, a straightforward definition moved from the difficult to the impossible. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary says a carol is a song or hymn of joy sung at Christmas in celebration of the nativity. But this leaves out the hundreds of carols in praise of trees, holly, ivy, drinking, feasting. It leaves out O Tannenbaum, it leaves out O Deck the Halls, Deck the Halls with Boughs of Holly. So I decided for the purposes of my book, the simplest and perhaps best definition of a carol is it's anything people decide is one. Um, at any rate, this popular form, as opposed to church music, only appeared in the 13th and 14th century. And while many European carols focused on the nativity, the English began, of course, as they meant to go on. The earliest English carol we know is actually a drinking song with every now and again this sort of vague gesture to um, the holiday. <coughs> By the end of the 17th century, though, carols were every, everywhere. In Germany, Vom Himmelhoch had been written by Mar Martin Luther himself. Parts of O Tannenbaum had been written, um, although the bulk of it is 19th century. Uh, New France had its first indigenous language carol written by Father Jean de Brebeuf in Huron, Wyandotte, in which Jesus lies in a birch bark, birch bark lodge and great chiefs come from afar bearing beaver pelts. Britain, we're, get, we're seeing a theme here, continued with its non-religious songbook. It had Deck the Halls with Boughs of Holly, The First Noel, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, as well as While Shepherds Watched Their Flocks by Night, which I've always liked because it was written by Nahum Tate, who is more famous to literature as the man who rewrote King Lear to give it a happy ending. <laughs> um, yeah, well. Um, while not everyone approved of what was considered to be a shocking lack of gravity in the lyrics, carols were widely popular, and soon they were written across the religious spectrum. Um, the Methodist Charles Wesley wrote the words to Hark the Herald's Angels Sing, um, a Roman Catholic produced Odeste Fidelis. Um, in 1742, of course, the London music world was introduced to what is now, was not then, a Christmas fav favorite, Handel's Messiah. 
And it's not surprising that this was produced by a German because in Germany, the carol tradition was always stronger than in English speaking countries. And um, it now developed further in 1820, Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, um, Silent Night um, was written. And you'll make a guess now, as with so many popular Christmas events, there's a perfectly charming an entirely fabricated story attached to the writing of this carol. The legend goes that the church organ in the small town of Obendorf in what is now Austria fell into disrepair just before the all-important Christmas service. And so the curate and the assistant organist cobbled together a carol to a guitar accompaniment. In reality, we know from the records that the church organ worked perfectly fine for several years after this date. Um, instead, the piece was heard by a visiting folk music enthusiast who included it as a folk song in a concert he staged professionally in Leipzig. It was published from then as an anonymous traditional piece and it took on its life from that. But even in Germany, where religious carols were more common, commerce still trumped religion. Um, some referred nominally to the nativity, but there's O Tannenbaum, there's Morgen kommt der Weihnachtsmann, uh, tomorrow the Christmas gift bringer is coming. Basically, the carols were about trees, toys, and, well, more toys. Carols took longer to emerge in England for that very English reason, class. Basically, carols were the songs of the working people, and they just weren't posh enough for the middle classes of the 19th century, written, as they were, said one, by superstitious and illiterate persons. In 1826, a popular anthology introduced carols to middle-class readers as though they were an entirely new thing. They ga it gave a complicated, and now as we're getting used to, entirely fabricated derivation of the word carol itself. It gestured towards an equally fabricated church history, but then went on quickly. It would confine itself to what it called domestic usages, in fact, it had to, because there was barely any ecclesiastical history. So instead, the author made one up. He took a form that was secular, and he made it religious. He took what was working class, and he made it middle class. And he was followed in this by collectors over the decades who rejected the popular carols, calling them deficient of interest to a refined ear the various trash, and against all morality and good taste. And for a similar reason, um, in the USA, the Afri African-American spirituals of the 19th century, things like Go Tell It on the Mountain, had to await the 20th century to be valued by mainstream culture. Instead, they found a way of what I think of as middle-classing these songs and that was to incorporate them into church services where they had never been before. And to do this, we suddenly get dozens of new carols written by, for the most part, church men and a few women. <coughs> Other carols, however, had more unexpected sources. Hark the Herald Angels Sing um, in the 19th century got music adapted from Mendelssohn, who of course was born into a Jewish family. Contique de Noël was set to music by the Jewish composer Adolphe Adam. The entirely secular Jingle Bells was written by a church organist, but it was based on a minstrel song by Stephen Foster. Um, the man who wrote that, by the way, was also the uncle of the banker J.P. Morgan. I just throw that in for... Um, by now, carols were being treated as though they had always existed and had always been popular. A man remembered his childhood in the 1860s, recalling that they sang what he called the ancient carols of England, which included, he said, O come all ye faithful, 
which in reality had been translated just a decade before he was writing. In 1903, um, a magazine praised Oxford University for keeping alive its ancient service, complete, it said, with Christmas tree selection from the Messiah. So Carol's tree, Messiah, three customs, none of which dated back more than 100 years, had suddenly become ancient. And in a similar way, in 1880, a bishop in Cornwall created a new Christmas Eve service that incorporated carols. It was very popular and copied by many churches, including at the end of World War I, the chapel of King's College, Cambridge. Um, in 1828, the BBC decided to broadcast it from King's, and again the following year. Just 10 years after that first service, it had magically aged, though, and the broadcaster's publicity material said, the festival has been held since the chapel was built nearly 500 years ago. <laughs> By now, the commercial secular Christmas song had also become as important in the American market. By the early decades of the 20th century, the music industry had begun to appreciate the holiday period as a driver of sales. More and more households were getting radio sets and thus increasing the audience for popular music more generally, seasonal songs in particular. So professional songwriters now set to work as well. In World War II, songs, these songs made a patriotic contribution, reminding servicemen far away of their families at home. And who knew more about such longings than immigrants and the children of immigrants? Some of the most famous and most enduring Christmas hits were therefore written by Jews. In 2014, ASCAP, which collects the songwriters' royalties, produced a list of the 20th century's most successful holiday songs. And of the top 30, half had at least one Jewish contributor and just three in the top 10 were by Christians. <laughs> but I like that because I felt that that was part of what this chameleon holiday is like. It changes your shape with every time you look at it. And so Jews writing Christmas songs, what could be more traditionally Christmas-like? Thank you very much. Of course there is a Christian element. It is part of the church calendar. But in terms of the holiday, truly from the Middle Ages, it has been a very minor element. Um, I, my, my, my editor said that I was not allowed to go on the radio, which I was about to do, and say, there is no damn Christ in Christmas, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying it here instead. Um, it, it, it truly was a day that escaped from the bounds of the church almost immediately. And in fact, the church really tagged along behind. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, um, you've done so much work on Victorian London and uh, the discrepancies between the rich and the poor. What was Christmas like for the poor Londoner? The, di the difference between Christmas, the, the difference for the rich and the poor in Christmas was extreme, um, not merely through 
um, the 19th century, but through history. Um, one of the other charming Christmas myths is that idea of this mysterious pastime in the Middle Ages when a poor man could just roll up at the Lord's gates and be invited in for Christmas dinner. I am telling you, again, not something that happened. There was a fa somebody did some fascinating research into the Duke of Buckingham in the 17th century, who was one of the richest people in the country, who entertained nearly a thousand people over the Christmas season. Um, political allies, family, people who worked for him, what we would call employees. I think of that nearly thousand people, she, uh, that she said there were three people in the end who could not firmly be identified as owing the Duke something. So Christmas was always very much a rich and poor. Thing. Yes. Uh, over the years, despots have had a bit of a thing with Christmas from Cromwell through to Bolsheviks. Did you focus on that at all? And if you did, were there any things that struck you about what motivated them and how successful they were against this popular non-Christian? Well, the 17th century revolt against Christmas, both in England with, as you say, the Puritans Oliver Cromwell and in North America, um, was very much driven precisely for um, the reason I say that, that, the, that, there was very, that, that Christmas has no scriptural authority. There is simply no mention in the book of when Christ was born, there is no marking of the day, and therefore, for the Protestants who only wanted to adhere to scriptural authority, there was simply no reason to celebrate the day. Um, I was talking um, last week in Scotland, and the Puritans in England banned Christmas in 1642. When Charles II came back to the throne in 1660, it was unbanned. Uh, it was uh, unbanned a little later in New England. Um, the canny Scots, however, the, the, Protest the Church of Scotland, who really hated Christmas, somehow magically got it banned again in 1690. And it's one of those weird things that people forgot about, and the ban held until 1958. <laughs> no one remembered to unban it. And Christmas was, therefore, for a quarter of a millennium, illegal in Scotland. Um, I don't think they had despots up there, though. Um, it was simply a matter, I think, not so much of um, despotic regime as religion. It was banned in Russia because they were trying to counter the church more generally, um, nothing to do with Christmas itself. Yeah. Hi, so um, my, my question, there's, I seem to have heard a lot of popular discourse that like there's origins in uh, pagan holidays as to why Christmas is at the time that it is, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to the origins of Christmas, I guess, pre-church, and, and if there's any connection there that's, there, there that, is, that's a real... What, what, what are the links uh, it, between Christmas and the pagan holidays? There are definitely links. Um, apart from anything else, when you work on a, an agricultural calendar, for the most part, this is the quiet time of year. It's also the time of year after the um, autumn slaughter, when you kill all the animals you can't afford to feed over the winter. So it's the one time that the moderately comfortable will have meat. Um, it's after the beer brewing season. So there are a lot of um, non-religious reasons. Christmas itself as, um, draws on several pagan holidays in terms of its dating. Um, Saturnalia, which actually is before Christmas, the Roman Calends, and the Roman New Year, all of which formed a holiday chain at the period. Um, there's also the, uh, the state religion of Rome, uh, well, worshipped Mithras um, by the later period. Uh, and supposedly, the birth of Mithras was on 
the 20, on the solstice. So it is likely that the solstice was chosen for all of those reasons pushed together. Um, the, as I say, it, it's a very boring, complicated reason having to do with when Easter is, um, why the solstice has moved four days, but the 25th was the solstice. So it, it's simply a marker. We are actually going to survive this year and head towards spring. There are two, yeah. time for two questions, uh, two Davids on some questions and one. Oh, yes. Which David are you going to ask? Well, we start with the first David. We start with the first David. There may be some questions about the date of when Christ was born, but there's not much argument about where Christ was born. And the last time I checked, there are no evergreen trees in that part of the world. <laughs> when did the Christmas tree, which has absolutely nothing to do with the, the Middle East, when did that take over? But no customs have anything to do with the Middle East. I mean, none of our Christmas customs have anything to do with the Middle East. But as I said, the, they come from the fact that they were doing these paradise plays on the 24th of December. You simply cannot have a deciduous tree on the 24th of December. Therefore, they used the fir tree. Um, but trying to mash religion and what little historical detail we have back into the holiday, you're just going to make yourself crazy. Uh, it's not going to work. There are folks who just want to ask questions, but I do have to give the next question to David. Could you stand up, David? Yes. It's worth taking Oh, yeah, down. thank you. <laughs> Look at that great sweater. <laughs> I enjoyed your lecture and your speech. Thank you. I'm green British born, and I really like the mince, uh, single button mince pie. <laughs> I've gone crazy on the groceries from the front end. But I would like to know, is it true that Charles Dickens was the first one to invent this expression? Um, yes, actually, that, there, there you go. I can finally tell you something is true. Um, <laughs> is it true that Charles Dickens was the first to say, bah humbug? Yes, it was. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure it was a perfectly popular expression of the day, but it was in A Christmas Carol, which became hugely successful. And there we, therefore, we think of it as a seasonal rejection. Thank you. There's a question actually near David as well. Yes. Um, I was curious. You sort of briefly mentioned uh, Hannah and Sada. And I was wondering if you could say a bit about, first of all, when that becomes associated with Christmas, and then secondly, when we sort of get the, the community sing-along messiahs. Um, <coughs> uh, absolutely. The history of Handel's Messiah, the 1742 production um, was at Easter. Um, the first section of the Messiah is um, about the nativity, but the two remaining sections are about the resurrection. So it is really an Easter um, piece of music, not a Christmas piece of music. Uh, the change comes very late in the 20th century, um, and so does the sing-along aspect. I mean, I don't even remember the sing-along aspect when I was a child. I think it's 1970s plus, and I think it has more to do with the um, arrival of uh, the, the, the actual singing groups, um, particularly in North America, it certainly started as a North American uh, custom, the, the, the group sing-along. The last question actually comes from Stephen. It's more, of a, it's more of three comments. I, uh, first of all, I enjoyed your talk tremendously, but it, it made me think of um, a couple of issues from my childhood growing up in a Jewish neighborhood and going to a public school, which was a Protestant school board school. Um, it's called Garden View in Ville Saint Laurent, for those of you who know the city. And it was interesting, the population of the school was probably 95% Jewish, but around this time of the year, we would sing Christmas carols. And, and it was very interesting to think about how to be a group of Jewish school children singing Christmas carols. And it, 
It just became very, almost the... Uh, but as I, as I point out, right. most Christmas songs were written by Jews. Right. <laughs> most, car most carols are not about the nativity. Right, and I can remember... Uh, the they are seasonal. And I think the thing to remember is that, I mean, one, one of the interesting things is that Hanukkah develops in the 1880s in North America as a more prominent holiday, as a counterweight to Christmas. So, so the other comment I remember as a child uh, growing up in the 60s, a big highlight of our lives would be getting the Eaton's catalog and then what would be called the Morgan's catalog for Christmas. And I remember terrible fights <laughs> between my brothers and I to look at the kid, to look at the toys in the catalog. You were showing examples of of toys up on your screen. Last comment, fast forward to about 2015. Uh, we keep a kosher home, and one night I was shopping at a farmer pre and I got so excited they had plum pudding that was kosher. <laughs> <laughs> so I had always wanted to know what it was. So I bought this, I bought this thing. I, I, I don't actually think we could end on a more <laughs> traditional <laughs> And he's going to tell you a little bit about um, Christmas in our collections and so that you'll be able to see some of our um, collections exhibited outside Chris. <laughs> see? You're making that up, aren't you? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> well done. Well done. Oh, oh, what a delightful talk. I really enjoyed that. Here at Rare Books and Special Collections, we, what we like to put on a good show. And in one way, that's literal. You saw David's shirt, and I want to draw attention to my tie, which is a vintage 1940s tie, which I thought looked rather seasonal as well. The other way, of course, is in the presentation we had before us. What's in competition here? Oh, it's finished. It's finished. It's finished. <laughs> It, um, I'm not surprised um, that we had as wonderful a talk as we did today. Um, when Judith started coming to study and research here at Rare Books and Special Collections, she immediately uh, charmed everyone through her, her humor and her personality. And uh, at one point I said, you're the our fifth beetle. <laughs> and that got into a conversation as whether you were uh, Pete Best or Stuart Sutcliffe, <laughs> and whether that mattered, and it didn't. I want to thank you for demystifying uh, this holiday in one way and historicizing the holiday. And I think in that way, you didn't damage it. In some ways, you've made it even more magical and special because now we have this wonderful story to go around the holidays and the traditions, the carols, the kosher plum pudding, <laughs> the other thing. And as a small token of our deep appreciation and friendship, I would like to give this to you. Now, in celebration of the season and of the talk, we have put together an exhibition. Now, one of the wonderful things um, we have collectively as uh, McGilligans and Montrealers and Canadians <coughs> is this wonderful collection of 400,000 books. So it's great when you have a theme like Christmas and the holidays and you start to look to see what you have, which is relevant. One of the disturbing things about my job is when you take a theme like Christmas and look and discover what you have on the topic. So, the usual suspects, wonderful children's books. We have the Sheila Bork collection of children's literature and related collections which have beautiful 
editions of children's books going back at least 200 years. And you'll see some examples of that. We have cookbooks because holidays are for eating. And we have a large cookbook collection, and some of you were here to hear about some of that from one of our donors, um, um, Joseph Armstrong. I've gotten the name wrong. Julian Armstrong. <laughs> Julian Armstrong, yes. I realize that. And so there's a lot of cookbooks. What you'll also see on display is some wonderful Victoriana, a scrapbook from the late 19th century with beautiful chromolithographic cards put in and flowers and different green greenery. So that has lasted for over a hundred and some odd years and that's on display. And there are a couple of other things which I thought I'd draw your attention to as you go and look in the cases. One is that you know, contemporary Quebec classic by Pierre Sorel, L'Avenement du Père Noël, Grand Roman Policier. The Kidnapping of Santa Claus, the great uh, police drama, which of course we all grew up with and loved. And Hannah Moore's 1795 a collection of stories. Hannah Moore, for those of you not familiar with her writing, was a, was a political writer, a religious writer, and a moral writer in late 18th and early 19th century Britain. And she wrote a new Christmas carol called The Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. But it's also included is a collection of other feel-good stories like The Carpenter or The Danger of Evil Company, <laughs> The Gin Shop or A Peep into a Prison, mm -hmm. and if that doesn't get you smiling, The Execution of Wild Robert being a warning to all parents. <laughs> so I'm sorry I did not get that in my stocking this year. But we invite you to go and have a look at some of our collections. And as I like to underline at each of these events, you have uh, an open invitation to come and consult and work with any of this material. And you require nothing but your own curiosity and desire. We're open Monday to Friday from 10 to 6 as well. Paragraph is also here to um, help you you wish to purchase a copy of the book, I have already. Um, it's going to be a Christmas gift for my wife. I might have to give it to her early because I want to start reading it now. And um, there's also going to be food and drink, although no kosher um, <laughs> But there will be other things available to you. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your evening.